Hi everyone, uh, we're going to try to talk about all the airlines and flight information and data that we possibly can. Um, and we're going to start by a uh, flight map showing for March. And at the end here you can see how it's kind of decreasing here. And basically that was because of coronavirus. So we kind of want to just review what's going on in the airline industry. Um, look at the largest companies in the world and kind of review just overall what's going on. So after thinking about all this carefully, uh, there's just so much data that I went through here. Uh, it's, just, it's just a lot of information. You may want to just kind of like fast forward through different sections, find out what you're really interested in. Um, you know, kind of look at the previews and see the uh, graphs and data and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, or just, uh, try to, uh, you know, maybe pause and think, uh, super carefully about any one of these, uh, detailed slides. There's just so much information. So, um, I wanted to start with this really kind of interesting and a funny graph. Uh, this is actually for American Airlines, uh, one of the busiest airlines in the world. Um, but, uh, you can see back in the 1950s, uh, the number of people per flight was about 10. Um, that um, kind of uh, went up uh, for the most part um, until about the 1980s at a pretty fast rate. Um, particularly around 1975, things really picked up, but uh, and then things kind of slowed down in the 1980s and 90s. Um, and then things actually have picked up uh, since about uh, 2004, uh, there was that crash, uh, the, you know, the 2001 uh, dot com crash, um, and then things have really picked up. So uh, passengers per flight has been about, uh, you know, 80 or even 100 uh, per flight, um, and that's kind of uh, why we see, at least in North America, It'd be interesting to see the specific numbers um, for other international carriers, but uh, this is some data I found for the American Airlines. Uh, so this is a pretty interesting graph to start with. Uh, I couldn't really find the source for it. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this website Statistica doesn't show it unless you uh, pay for a extra fee, but this is uh, their estimates on the uh, worldwide revenues. So I used some of these numbers and then combined it with another guess um, that I saw on Wikipedia for the uh, total uh, in billions. So that's a lot of money every year if you think about it. Uh, billion, it's almost a trillion dollars uh, per year in airline flights. Um, and you can kind of see the graph over the years here, which is great. Um, I think I might be able to download, can I brown? Uh, I can't download the Excel spreadsheet. But... Um, Basically, um, it's doubled um, in you know the past. You could maybe say ten years, um, but uh, certainly in the last uh, you know fifteen twenty years, uh, the airline industry has essentially doubled in revenue. Um, so that's different than the uh, profit, um, but. Uh, I think the profit is something like around 10%, um, but uh, you might want to double check that. Uh, but anyway, it gives you some idea. So um, I really like this website a lot because it shows uh, such great um, live data of flight traffic. Um, I think I showed a com image earlier about that. Um, but here is the uh, daily tracking statistics, and I believe this is number of flights. Um, so uh, you can see, uh, you know, the kind of the cycles um, going down around December. Um, I think that is slightly different than the. Uh, data that we saw. Remember, this is, I think this would be international, so um, it's kind of the combined, uh, like the other data was the TSA, which is uh, kind of uh, American statistics. So the cycle showed a low point 
um, around February. Um, this shows a low point around uh, November or December every year. Um, so you can see that um, you know globally, uh, flights were already kind of low um, around March, um, but then they way dropped, right? So um, you know the one weird thing is when I first started to look at the coronavirus, I went to the uh, flight uh, radar twenty four. Uh, and looked at the flights, and I was like, man, they're still flying. It looks like just this number. But I think part of what happens is that so many of the flights are, there's just so many flights that it's difficult to see exactly how many flights are on the screen. So um, it essentially looks like very similarly, um, you know, even though there's 80,000 airplanes on the screen, uh, the difference between 80 and 160,000 when there's that many on a regular computer display, uh, little airplane icons, you just uh, can't see everything. Um, it's super interesting to actually zoom in. I had a lot of fun zooming into like the Bay Area and also uh, up in Seattle and kind of like looking at the mini airplanes, little pictures of helicopters flying around and kind of seeing their flight paths and things like that. Um, so it's actually a lot easier to see what's going on right now because there's less airplanes in the sky. Um, so you might want to just give it a try. Uh, flight Radar 24 was pretty good. There's also another one um, out there, uh, Flight Aware, that uh, you can kind of use as a backup. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is one of the data things that was pretty cool. Uh, so when I first saw this data, I was actually kind of made me angry. I was like, man, this is just, oh, what's going on? Um, it made sense to me at first, but then I started to look at it even more carefully, and I'm like, oh, it doesn't make sense, so on. But essentially, the uh, lower blue line here is for 2016, and then the, the green line, unbelievably, is 2017, and then the yellow line is 2018, and the red line is 2019, and the darkest blue is this year. So, uh, you know, it. you can see that, um, you know, the part that didn't make sense to me is, wow, there is a lot of more flights happening each year tracked by uh, online. So there's like these, uh, you can also do this for sailboats and marine traffic. They put these uh, like transponders in your boat and you essentially know where <laughs> the big tankers are and things like this. Um, if you're a smaller sailboat, that matters a lot. Um, a lot of smaller airplanes and aircrafts maybe don't have these. I, I'm not sure what the regulations are, but essentially, uh, you know, so it's hard to say the exact statistics just based on tracking data. But it's super cool to see the airplanes on a screen and you know that for sure, well, supposedly those are airplanes. And the data is uh, more international in some senses than the TSA data because the TSA is only, uh, you know, American airports and all the carriers for that are primarily, uh, you know, in North America. So, but this is international, so gives us a good idea. So you can see that, wow, you know, uh, 200,000 to essentially uh, below even 100,000 flights and even says as low as... Uh, you know, 70,000 on the radar here. So um, that is a significant loss. Um, the stock prices, I would say, were down about 50% or so in a similar fashion to the air traffic. Um, so it would have been nice to, like, think about that and say, well, okay, you know, is the price going to drop by half? But a lot of it may be irrational and other things. So... Um, but uh, this was a very cool graph. I thought you'd like it. So I'll show you a pie graph in a moment here, but um, this kind of gives you, um, this is for uh, last year data, um, and it kind of was compared to this year's data, but you can kind of see um, what the typical flight might be like, right? So um, in... Uh, a lot of flights happen on Fridays, um, and perhaps the uh, next most day is on a Monday. So a lot of people will fly on a Monday and fly back on a Friday. Um, and the interesting thing about this um, is that uh, actually the flights are probably um, most likely uh, flying out 
on a Friday, right? So, or say a Thursday. So it's there's a lot of flights or flying back. Um, so those days, uh, Friday and Thursday, are going to be the most expensive, and Sunday and Monday. So um, you can see a lot of people might fly back on a Sunday. Um, or they might fly out on a Monday. And actually, Mondays are slightly more, um, depending on the uh, week. Um, so it could be, uh, you know, some weekends depend. Um, but uh, so this graph is great for that because you can kind of see uh, the specific uh, sequence, right? So this was actually for uh, last... Uh, it goes from March, April, May, and into a little bit into June. So this is quite a number of months of data. So you can kind of see, um, you know, as it gets towards the summer, the number of flights were starting to go up again. Um, and the sequence here kind of can change slightly. So this whole concept of, you know, flying, uh, you know, back, or flying out, um, you know, uh, on a Thursday or flying back on a Friday type of thing. And then even what's going on on a Saturday um, can kind of change. So actually these Saturday, Thursday, Saturday is pretty much always a great day uh, to fly on. Um, you can see that most of these low points are on Saturdays. Um, and then that's pretty much consistent all throughout this. And the high points are typically on the Friday or a Monday or you got Thursday and so on, Friday, Friday, and so on. So, um, you know, essentially a lot of people want to fly, uh, you know, on those days. But I have kind of a graph here showing the uh, specific uh, pie chart for this, which is kind of cool to see. Hi, so um, I kind of messed around with the uh, TSA data. Um, and uh, this was just for like uh, about a few months of data and just looked at the total number of travelers by weekday. Um, for some reason, I could not find this anywhere on the internet. Um, so I basically had to manually calculate it myself. Um, and what you see here is that Saturday is the least traveled day and also probably uh, Tuesday. Um, so uh, that's the least number of travelers in the airport is on Saturday, believe it or not. Um, so um, the uh, most number of travelers is actually on Thursday. So, uh, you know, basically flying on a Saturday or Tuesday will probably be the cheapest. Flying on a Thursday will probably be the most expensive or on a Saturday or Sunday, excuse me, or a Monday. Um, and then, uh, so basically, uh, you know, a lot of people are flying out on, you know, say a Thursday or coming back on a Thursday, um, and flying out on a Monday or so, so, or flying back on a Sunday, so, or flying out on a Sunday, <laughs> excuse me. So, um, so basically, uh, this was a pretty cool graph just to get an idea of uh, the uh, work days and the weekdays that people are traveling on. I also have one other graph that might be interesting to look at. So let's just do a little test here. So of these uh, most busiest airports in uh, North America or America, um, basically what we want to do is see what the flights might be. Um, just do like a price graph here. Um, say you were uh, in Seattle and trying to fly to uh, New York and just kind of see what the prices might be. So here's kind of the price graph. Um, what I was doing here was kind of looking at, uh, you know, as like a recent fairly quick flight. But so essentially way in the distance here, it's like $88, right? And... Uh, And sorry about one more final graph here. This is kind of just the details of the March crash. Uh, kind of zooming in here so you can see uh, what's going on. Uh, commercial flights uh, compared to total flights as well. So you can see, you know, there is a lot of cargo. Uh, I was surprised, uh, you know, how much cargo is actually being shipped. 
Um, but uh, there was like coronavirus restrictions even on cargo. Uh, you know, a lot of companies were saying you got to wait two weeks just to even after it gets off the airplane and so on and so. So um, the other interesting thing about this graph is you can see the cycles and there's actually even a couple blips in the commercial cargo. Um, I wish I could um, see the precise dates of some of these blips but it looks like you know there's a high point actually in February which is way ironic um, because that's the down cycle for North America so actually that's a peak for most of these um, uh, most of these flights I don't know how true this is but I actually think it's per oh I'm sorry this is actually per week so it's not uh, per February, so you actually have certain days of the week that are uh, more significant in terms of flights, um, and that is actually, uh, you know, obviously makes sense. It's probably just the weekend days here. Um, I can probably confirm that, um, but uh, or weekdays. Uh, let me just check real quick. Thanks. So uh, this is kind of an interesting graph to start with. Um, it's uh, mainly the American uh, airports and all the airlines. Um, and uh, it was uh, on this website that I found from the Bureau of Transportation and Statistics, um, which uh, may be similar to the data that you can find on the TSA. But what I liked about this is that it goes all the way back to 2002. Um, and you can kind of see, I mean, that's that's basically 20 years ago, right? So, uh, you know, with the coronavirus, um, you know, this doesn't really have all the data here. Um, it uh, does go into January, February, March. Um, it shows 2002-1, but actually that's... Um, uh, that's kind of a different data point here. Um, so that's actually the uh, kind of the higher side of the late or far right of the graph. But essentially what you see here, which um, was interesting to me, was kind of seeing the uh, cycles here, right? So, um, and then you kind of see a slight dip around 2010, right? Um, but, uh, and maybe some of that might have been due to uh, the kind of the financial crisis around 2007 and 8 um, and uh, but in general what you see is that most of those peaks in fact all of them are precisely on July um, and the low points are in February so the interesting thing about um, this uh, crash is that actually the uh, February time frame which is approximately when we started to see um, the coronavirus problem uh, was actually at the low point anyway for the season. So a lot of airlines were maybe even expecting um, lower traffic. Um, so it, uh, that may be one interesting fact here. So, but in general, by uh, you know, February and then March, things really jump up. So actually, it's, it's really more on the, uh, you know, even, even December is kind of a slower month for airlines uh, given Christmas and everything so that's kind of a, another interesting fact right and in fact uh, it's right after uh, September uh, is September October November so it's like October November all the way through February um, things are colder in North America and also slower so um, but basically this has been going on for you know, probably forever, right? Um, so uh, it uh, uh, is interesting because we don't yet have the data, at least on their website. I grabbed this, uh, you know, it's June, and for some reason they don't even have uh, data. They only have it from back to March. So but this is basically the latest data that we have. Um, you can kind of see, um, you know, what's been going on with the flights. So I would say that, um, you know, from a quick calculation, uh, you know, it's, uh, we were up at about, uh, say 80 million flights. Um, wow. That's 80 million flights per month, um, or 80 million passengers. Sorry. Wow. Um, 
yeah, that's passengers per month. So, and I think what happened here is basically we're down to about half that, right? So uh, the imagery doesn't really show that. It maybe looks like 30% loss um, or so, but you can basically see that. And further, it may have even dropped more than this. Um, but uh, but basically, this gives you a basic idea for what happened um, and also uh, the past 20 years. So that's why I really like this. So uh, here is kind of a graph showing the world's busiest cities. Um, I really like this one um, because there are some surprises at least. Um, you know, you can notice that Dubai um, has a significant amount of traffic per year, um, almost about... Uh, 90 million passengers per year and this data is actually kind of older about two years old um, so um, you know London has a lot and Hong Kong uh, Amsterdam uh, probably the one that's uh, confusing is that you know why would London have more traffic than Amsterdam um, there's just more people in the area of Amsterdam um, and also in Hong Kong, right? So London is actually getting quite a lot of traffic, a um, surprising amount of traffic. Um, and then, of course, there's Singapore here um, and Bangkok. I've noticed that uh, Bangkok has a lot of uh, cheaper flights sometimes um, if you're trying to get into kind of the heart of Asia. Um, and then Istanbul here is very high. So, um, you know, and then uh, Taiwan and then Kuala Lumpur and so on. So, uh, you know, in general, what you see is that New York City, um, you know, San Francisco isn't even listed on here, nor is Los Angeles um, as a major, uh, you know, city for uh, total passengers. So um, there are some surprises like that that, um, you know, are interesting. So uh, there are a number of ways to kind of study these airlines, right? And, uh, you know, there's kind of the uh, revenue and profits or assets or even the uh, total stock value or the market capitalization or even you could look at the number of employees. So <clears throat> and then there's also the number of passengers that they uh work with every year so uh, I just wanted to look at kind of like all those factors believe it or not uh, graph them and kind of uh, take a look at them with you uh, so uh, before we get into all the financial details I just wanted to show my favorite graphs here of kind of the uh, number of miles flowing so it's like passengers it's not only the passenger but just the actual distances so uh, you can see that uh, you know uh, most of the world still flies on American Delta United Emirates um, I noticed there's a lot of flights out of Dubai for instance um, Lufthansa um, and International Airline Group Air France uh, China Southern and so on so uh, these are the uh, relative numbers of kilometers flown in millions so uh, each one of these are millions so that's uh, billions of miles uh, you know 350 uh, billion <laughs> miles uh, so that's just a lot of miles um, flown and before we get into all those details, um, this is kind of like a relative graph, and I really like this because uh, independent of the total number of miles, you can kind of see it all on a chart. Um, so you can say, uh, you know, like American Airlines here, uh, of those, uh, you know, Air China is flying approximately half of what, um, you know, maybe a little bit more than half than, say, Delta in United, and so on. So you can kind of see how that's all broken up in terms of percentages just for the top. So this isn't percentages of all flights. This is just relative to each other. So, you know, it's kind of hard to see what's really going on. So what I would say is if you don't trust that to you to look at a map like this, and you can kind of get an idea for what's really going on in terms of uh, air traffic. And this map is just awesome. So you can kind of see all that traffic in Europe, North America, relatively little traffic in Africa and South America, and not too much even in Australia. So uh, don't take my word for it. Just try to take a look, uh, you know, not just at the data, but look at actual flights.
Uh, so here you go for Air Freight, um, and one little detail about me is that I was really interested in uh, pickup delivery and moving, helping people move from house to house, things like this. Um, but Air Freight is quite a bit different, and it is complicated helping someone move internationally. Um, but uh, you can see that Federal Express here, Emirates, Qatar, and uh, UPS, these guys are doing a lot of shipping. Um, in terms of freight. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of different ways to look at this and the other thing to think about is that if you have to do a shipment uh, sometimes you can pay fifty to a hundred dollars and get a fairly large kind of uh, chest full of stuff moved um, underneath the airplane and you're flying up above with it. So that may be an interesting way to uh, ship things. Um, so cargo um, I think a lot of cargo may go with regular flights. Uh, I think I read the exact number at one point. Um, I don't want to say exactly, but I think it might be like 30%, but who knows exactly what that number is in terms of uh, cargo on a regular flight. It might be as low as 5, 10, 20%. Who knows? Depends on the airline and a lot of factors. So, uh, But here's the freight numbers just uh, for those who are interested. Okay, so what we're looking at here is the largest airlines in the world, um, going uh, basically, you know, United States, Germany, France, Spain, uh, China, and Japan. So um, this is uh, all the data here, so you get to see the uh, number of employees, which is pretty interesting, um, the profit, which is uh, extremely small, and the total amount of sales or the revenue. Um, and then the assets. So uh, you can also look at uh, the number of airplanes and things like that. Um, but I think this is just the total assets, uh, including like buildings and other things. Um, so in general, what you see here is that Delta, American, uh, Lufthansa, United, um, and I guess in some sense uh, China is uh, kind of in one group here, and then uh, Southwest and uh, this Japanese airline. Um, is kind of uh, in the other. So uh, you do have that uh, Sp Spanish UK Ireland airline, which is the IAG, um, also listed here. So uh, and actually, they have quite a, a good profit um, in Europe there. Um, and you can see uh, probably um, the lowest profit margins are in uh, probably Asia um, with a slight slightly better profit in Japan relative to uh, mainland, uh, China, and so on. So, uh, But there are a lot of airlines um, going, uh, you know, in the Philippines and in those islands in, uh, you know, the oceanic area. Um, so uh, those are also pretty interesting. So the revenue here... Um, is important but uh, it's also uh, kind of key seeing uh, just how little profit a lot of these companies are making. So uh, you know uh, beyond just thinking about uh, profits and uh, revenues and all that it is important to look at the uh, number of aircraft. Um, you'll see that uh, you know uh, there's companies that you wouldn't quite expect. So, for example, Federal Express shows up in this list, uh, which doesn't show up at all on a passenger list in terms of number of aircraft, right? So, um, you know, they have Federal Express has more than Lufthansa or Turkish Airlines um, and so on, right? So, uh, there's a couple different ways to look at that. Uh, there's also the uh, pie graph, which is kind of more of a relativistic way of looking at number of aircraft for each of these industries site or airlines and i'll just zoom in here to kind of show you the revenue to profit and then also the assets to profit for each airline so uh this is a really nice graph um chart here because it shows you uh the uh, airline passengers per year and this is only for north america but um, you can kind of see that American, Delta, and Southwest, and United have a big share here. So uh, some of the uh, budget airlines um, actually have a much smaller share So um, in terms of passengers. But, um, you know, it, it seems to me, um, you know, like if you look at JetBlue or Spirit here, you know, their combined total is about 50%. But... 
when you look at like the West Coast uh, or specifically around New York, um, you know, some of these uh, smaller companies are actually taking up quite a lot um, for specific cities, I think. So, um, you know, the data is kind of hard to say. So, um, you know, but in general, I think what's happening here is that a lot of the international flights um, that are done uh, are still done by these uh, big four um, companies here in North America, essentially American, Delta, Southwest and United, so um, you know they're uh, they're quite a bit different in terms of the stock prices and other things like that. So uh, this graph is uh, one that I kind of worked on and made up essentially, um, and it uh, you know it basically shows you this uh, everyone else concept. So. Um, you know, the, the largest airlines uh, in the world uh, have a revenue of about $50 uh, billion, dollars, I think, per year. Uh, and, uh, you know, but the total revenue is almost at $1 trillion, or about, say, uh, you know, $800 uh, billion. Dollars. Um, so you can kind of see that, actually, uh, of the airlines that you've probably heard of, um, they make up, um, you know, maybe 45% uh, or so of the total here. So really, um, you know, uh, most of the people, most of the airlines um, are other kind of airlines outside of uh, the ones that you may have already heard of. So now uh, this kind of gives you that perspective. Uh, so, wow, when I first found this data on uh, FlightAware, uh, I was just like, wow, this is exactly what I'm looking for. I'm having such a pain just trying to find real numbers about number of aircraft, like what's going on uh, in America and, you know, the United Kingdom or, you know, all over the world, basically, with airplanes. And how do I know, like, where's busy, where's not, and so on. Um, and obviously the graphical imagery really helps a lot. Um, but sometimes it's nice to just have actual numbers too, and uh, that's what you're looking at right here. So, uh, you know, I was looking at this data, and I was like, I started looking at it more carefully, and I'm like, wait a second, uh, this has almost like seven or eight million daily average aircraft seen in the United States, and look at everybody else. But then I thought about it, and I'm like, okay, well, um, actually Germany and United States, uh, United Kingdom, Netherlands, Canada. I mean, actually, there's, uh, you know, uh, these are a lot smaller land area kind of places, right? So, and, uh, but then, yeah, so it's just, uh, it's just really interesting to think about how many aircrafts are in the United States. And it's kind of visible uh, when you look at the uh, imagery, like the actual little icons of those airplanes flying over and all that. Um, but uh, the data actually shows, like, the numbers, and you're just like, whoa, what is going on? So anyway, uh, so you kind of have to like regraph all this data and essentially take out the United States. And even then, it still doesn't really make sense, right? Because you're like, wow, India, look at how few aircrafts are in India. Um, and uh, also, uh, where is China on this? So uh, you see Hong Kong and China are included, right? So, uh, but they're just not getting a lot of flights. But um you know, it's uh, uh, it could be that that's where the airplanes are registered, um, or something else. So it's just, uh, yeah. So it's just uh, perhaps you have to kind of uh, you know understand. So these transponders, apparently, what happens is you have these uh, transponders, and there's various uh, frequencies and modes, and you basically keep them on your aircraft. And it could be that they're registered with certain uh, countries, but not others. Uh, so next here, we're just going to talk a little bit about the airline stocks. The uh, details of what was going on in the graph here. So um, what I wanted to do primarily is look at this section, um, which is kind of the uh, more recent uh, last decade or 10 years. Um, and, you know, this is done based on percentages. So uh, the price is uh, basically... Uh, you know, 
if the price went up by a factor of two, then you see, you know, whatever, 100% gain or something like this, right? So um, basically, um, you know, you can see that different stocks kind of uh, get the high point. Um, the S&P 500, you can see on that dark blue or this blue line on the top uh, kind of outperformed at some point um, the rest of the airline industry. So you can see that happened right about here. So after 2013, so if you look at it from 2013, um, the airline industry did better. But when you start to bring it up into 2016, um, something around there, uh, the, you know, the average company in America, because the S&P 500 is about 80% of all the companies well, in the entire stock market, right? So that means that basically since 2016, a lot of these airlines have actually not done that well relative to the S&P 500. So, um, you know, but before that, if you take all that data and include it, then you see that, um, you know, the, the airlines have done way better. So a lot of people that got in, you know, in, you know, 2011 or so, um, you know, especially for like Spirit Airlines, it looks like, you know, huge gains. But there was also huge losses starting around that same time frame, which was 2016, right? So, um, but you can still see that of those, even in recent years, United actually has done quite well relative to these others. So um, I think one reason is that, you know, there was some such big changes for these new kind of, uh, you know, supposedly a $50 flight to, you know, Florida or something like this. Um, they're even cheaper kind of deals, right? So um, the, uh, you know, Alaska here is this silver line, um, and uh, Southwest is kind of the purple line. So Southwest actually has the longest history. Like if you go way back to the, you know, early 1990s, Southwest shows up here as a, real company but even united and the others were kind of like restructured around uh 2005 which actually is interesting because that's prior to the 2007 8 crash um, but these vertical lines were just lines that i thought were particularly interesting um in the history of all the stocks right so you can kind of see that certain time periods there was spikes in the prices and then downward trends after it got way too high. So, um, you know, it's uh, basically pretty interesting to see. So there's a lot of really kind of um, similarities between the companies, um, but it really changes quite a lot depending on who you're looking at. So here you can see American Airline um, did quite well, right? But then it kind of dropped after that relative to the others. So now it's doing like basically the worst compared to all those others. So, um, you know, I, one thing I did do that was kind of interesting is to check out all the websites and just try to, you know, buy a ticket and see what the procedures are like and even go through the, you know, companies that do like tons of air tickets so you can kind of, uh, you know, compare um, and kind of see what the difference is uh, for your region. So, you know, for where I live out in the Pacific Northwest, um, you know, like say Alaska airline is doing a lot of flights in our area, but doesn't do a lot of area flights, say in New York or on the East coast. It does, but not a whole lot. Right. So, uh, but it is surprising how many flights they still do do. Um, but anyway, so, um, uh, I would say, you know, um, uh, you can see the difference here um, starting in around uh, January, February 9th or so, how the S&P fell and uh, essentially the uh, airline industry fell with it, but maybe, you know, significantly faster. Um, you know, the S&P maybe lost says about 26% down to negative 15. So there you go. Uh, it's like 30, 40%. Um, and the airline industry was at like 20, say, and dropped to, 
negative 70. So it lost almost 100% of the value there. So there's a lot of uh, differences, but each company is kind of different. You can see American Airlines kind of um, did perhaps drop the least of all those, which is interesting. Um, it may be because it was already pretty low and already struggling. So, um, you know, but uh, uh, but this should kind of give you an overview of what's... Uh, so here's kind of like an overall complex graph of what's been going on in the American airline industry. Um, so basically I took uh, the, uh, you know, largest by passenger uh, companies and also looked at... Uh, largest by revenue and kind of took uh, some of the major ones. So right now what we're looking at is Delta, American, Southwest, United Airlines. Those are the four largest um, making up uh, something like, say, 40%, say, of the total uh, airline industry. Um, and actually that, I believe, is a, a global number, um, but uh, it, it's a significant amount, right? So uh, but, um, so basically what you see here is, um, you know, a lot of these companies around, uh, you know, 2006, uh, seven, eight, nine, that area, um, essentially there was, um, you know, a major financial crisis in 2008, um, globally, um, a lot of airlines went bankrupt and, um, What's really strange right now is that uh, we, you know, a lot of their stocks just don't show up um, back before um, 2006. So that, to me, is really scary um, because, well, you know, maybe they would disappear again, right? I mean, these are big airlines, um, United Airlines, um, you know, American Airlines, Delta, so on. Um, so what we do notice here, though, is that um, the graph shows the yellow here and the silver on top. And even the uh, LUV, which is uh, Southwest Airlines, um, these are kind of the uh, biggest changes. And some of this is ridiculousness. Um, others, you know, it's just uh, great gains. Um and huge losses. So um, these airlines, um, you know, this is on the far right here is percentage. So this is like 2,000%, 3,000% gain in price. That's a lot, um, you know. But again, that's over five years, which is still a short period of time, um, or 10 years, and also significant down up to, like, imagine if you have stock at 3,000, drops to 2,000, 1,000%. You know, 30 percent. Uh, it's still a huge loss, right? So a lot of these companies have dropped, um, you know, essentially about 30, 40 percent in with the coronavirus, um, and you can see that the volume has spiked up to about where it was uh, back in 2009 ish or late 2008. Um, so that's the volume for the S&P 500. So the kind of the middle color blue is the S&P 500, um, which is the kind of the foundational graph for this, um, the volume and the price volume trend. Uh, that's all based on the S&P 500. So you're kind of comparing how the airlines have done relative to the S&P 500 in this graph. everyone someday gets to uh, travel on an airplane and uh, see something uh, from a totally different perspective, uh, perhaps uh, from a perspective uh, way out there. Thanks.